last whatever it was. Uh, Paddy is, um, i just brief, should I just say a couple of things? Do you want to say anything? No, you say, that's fine. I, I, we've known Paddy for quite a long time. We were in Herefordshire <laughs> together when Joe and I were in Herefordshire at the same time, but you've been a minister for many years. You're currently <coughs> chaplain for Jews for Jesus International. Uh, so you're international chaplain for that. So you work uh, across the world being chaplain to kind of a, a really um, important organisation. And um, you're just taking time and you love God's word and love God and want to share with us. So thank you, Paddy, for taking time. Thank okay. you. Well, it's good to be with you all. And uh, we'll have some good discussion uh, a little bit later on. As we begin this um, series on Exodus, there are some themes that always stand out for me in this book. And those are what I want to share with you in the series. Exodus proclaims God's great act of delivering his people from difficult and oppressive situations. And therefore, um, it's a very topical subject, isn't it? Because we need <coughs> delivering from a difficult situation right now. And God invites his people into an intimate relationship with him. And it's an intimacy that begins in chapter three, as for the first time in the Bible, God gives us his name. And you might like to have Exodus three open in front of you because we will refer to it um, from time to time. And it's important that he gives us his name because like the Israelites of old, when we start our journey with Jesus, we all want to know who this God is that we are being called to serve. So let me just recap very quickly on what has happened so far in Exodus before we get to chapter three. For 400 years, the people of Israel had lived in Egypt. 200 of those years, they were slaves. And when the new Pharaoh decreed that all Israelite baby boys must not live, one Israelite boy named Moses is rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the royal court. And then as a young man grappling with his Israelite heritage as he lived as an Egyptian prince, Moses gets involved in an Egyptian-Israeli fight and he kills the Egyptian. And so he runs away to Midian, and this is where God appears to him. He sees a burning bush in the desert, and it's not consumed. And from that bush, God speaks. So this is Exodus 3, 6 and 7. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people and have heard their cry because of their slave masters. I know their sufferings and I have come to deliver them out of Egypt and I'm sending you to do it. And uh, Moses' initial response is to back away from such an awesome task as I did when I was first called into ministry. And as you might as God is calling you. So Moses said in verse 11, who am I that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God says, I will be with you. And then Moses brings us to one of the most important things God ever says. Moses says to God, if I go to my people and say, God has sent me to you, and they say, what is his name? What do I say? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said, say this to them. The Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is how I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So this tells us three things, and I want to break it down a little bit so that we, we, uh, we don't misunderstand. Firstly, he says to Moses, I am who I am. 
He didn't say that that was his name. Actually, all that he's saying at this point is before you worry about me and how I compare to the many gods of Egypt and Babylon and Philistia around you, understand that I am a living being. He's the supreme beings and beings are relational. Knowing God is relational. And that is, of course, is a truth that permeates throughout the Bible. Secondly, God says, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And he still hasn't given Moses his name. He simply puts the statement of his being in the place of a name. The one who is, who from eternity is there, has sent me to you. And thirdly, he says to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord. Hebrew for that is just four letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, the Lord. Normally, uh, it's in capitals in our Bibles and is always in capitals all the way through from this moment on. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. So finally, he gives us his name. And the Hebrew, Y-H-W-H, -H, is the same root, I am. And it probably would have been pronounced something like Yahweh. That's what most Jewish scholars believe it was pronounced. I say probably because we don't know. We don't know for two reasons. In ancient Hebrew, there were no vowels. You just picked up the sense of a word from conversation, from experience, from using it all the time. You just knew what vowels to put in, but they were never written. They are in modern Hebrew with little <laughs> dashes and dots under the letters, you've probably seen them, but not in ancient Hebrew. And the second reason we don't know how it was pronounced is that the Jews took the third commandment so seriously, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain they never actually pronounced it. So they had, uh, we'll come to that in a moment, they had another way of talking about God without pronouncing those four letters, Y-H-W-H. -H. So he says, I am who I am, Ea Asha Ea. And Ea is the first person singular of the verb to be, as in, I am walking down the road. However, when it's used as a standalone description, I am is the ultimate statement of self-sufficiency and self-existence. So God's existence is not dependent on any one or anything else. He is eternally constant God, ever present, always unchangeable. This is God's amazing name. It's used over 4,000 times in the Old Testament. There are other words for God in the Old Testament in addition to that, and they all begin with El. There's El itself, there's Eloa, which we don't know exactly what that means, and then there's Elohim, which is the plural of both El and Eloa. Now, the central sound of YHWH -H is, of course, the two H's. And that is the sound of breath, which immediately should bring to your mind many connotations. Genesis 1, God breathes life into his creation. In Ezekiel, he breathes into a bunch of bones and they come to life. Jesus breathes on the disciples and the Holy Spirit rests upon them. And the other important thing we should notice here that Abraham was not always Abraham, nor was Sarah always Sarah. They were Abram and Sarai. So what happens here? Well, YHWH, Yahweh, is the covenant name of God. That is to say, it's a relational name. 
that always has a promise attached to it, describing something about God's character. And a major covenant in Genesis is what is known as the blood covenant. And it's made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. I say it's made with Abraham, Abraham, <laughs> but um, it's a covenant which is normally between two people where Abraham spent the whole time snoring in a corner. He didn't uh, uh, participate in this simply because he couldn't. But a blood covenant goes all the way from Genesis 15 through to Jesus shedding his blood on the cross. And it's a covenant that forms the basis of our wedding ceremony today. So if two people were making a blood covenant with one another, they would first of all take off their coats, which symbol symbolize all that they were, all that I am, we say in the wedding covenant, don't we? All that I am, I give to you. God says to Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. That's who I am. And that's what I'm giving you. The next thing they would do is to take their belt and their shield, which stood for everything that they had. God, of course, owned the whole universe. But he says to Abraham at this point in verse 7 of Genesis 15, I will give you this land. And uh, of course, again, in the wedding covenant, all that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. And then what they would do is they would make a figure of eight as they walked around and met in the middle. And the figure of eight is the symbol of eternity. In the marriage ceremony, we say, till death us do part. And God's commitment is to be with us and to guide us forever, for eternity. Eternal life starts the moment we believe in Jesus. And then as they stand facing each other, they make a small mark on their wrists, just here at the bottom of their hand. And uh, between the older and the radius. And with a knife, they allow blood to flow and they let it flow down into their hands and then palms, and then they shake hands, which many believe is the origin of the handshake, a sign of friendship. In um, uh, some parts of Africa to, today, um, the, um, the name for friend is Jairima, which literally means friend of the blood. Right, I'll go out separately then. Yeah. <laughs> it's lovely out then. And then they were blood brothers. So if you were attacked by somebody as you were walking, you know, think of the Good Samaritan um, picture. If somebody attacked you, the first thing you would do is to bear your arm like that. And they would see the scar. And then they would think twice about attacking you because they didn't know how big your br blood brother was. And of course, when Jesus died on the cross, he was pierced there between the ulna and the radius, not in the hand as most um, paintings show. That could never support the weight of your body, but it could there. And then the last thing they did in making this covenant was they swapped names. And this is where we're coming to. They swapped names. And still today, there is in some circles a practice when you get married to have a double barreled name, which is essentially swapping names. Until Abraham entered into this covenant with God, his name was Abraham. And Sarah's name was Sarai. We know that the new name that God gave Abraham means father of nations. But to get there, God added the Hebrew letter He, an H, to his name. And in Sarai's name, 
he changed the yod, the I, to the letter H. So God becomes inherently part of their identities. You will be called Abraham and you will be called Sarah. And God wants to be known then as the God of Abraham. And you will notice here then that uh, in Exodus 3, by the time we get there, Abraham's had sons, Isaac has had a son. So he's now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's how he is referred to throughout the rest of the Old Testament. So it's not surprising that the Hebrew letter He on its own, the sound of breath, is the way that Jews have written God's name as shorthand so that they, they are assured that they never quote his name in vain. One final implication of this magnificent name is that Jesus takes it as his divine identity. At his trial, Jesus was accused of blasphemy. In other words, accused of claiming to be God. When did he do that? He never said, I am God. But he did say, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection, and the life. And in the Old Testament, God revealed himself in different ways by adding to that name Yahweh different characteristics, such as Yahweh Jarah, I am your provision, or Yahweh Shalom, I am your peace. And for Jesus, the climax of these, answering the criticism of the Jewish leaders, Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. You can't have seen Abraham. To which Jesus replies, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. As we stand in the midst of this unknown situation, take hold of that name. This is the God who goes before us. This is the God who stands with us. This is the God who covenants himself with you through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. This is the God who just is there and he's there for us now. Amen. So let's um, open that up for comments or discussion, questions. <clears throat>